Good morning. You might know things are a little bit different this morning for now. Uh, as we celebrate the fourth, we remember that we are God's people, Christian citizens, as well as citizens of a country. And so we are honoring our country a few minutes before the actual service as God's people. You notice I'm not robed right now, but will be shortly. Um, are those, I would ask another question is how many veterans do we have here who have served in the military? If you can, stand up. I know there's a career guide back there. I know Mark is and others too. But um, we thank them for their service. And And I think, and we'll probably mention a word or two in the sermon, but um, it's more critical than ever that we witness as God's people and citizens of our country. If any of you read any of the editorials in today's paper, um, as I did, I was, I don't know, disheartened. Let's put it that way. Um, and... Uh, in terms of, I think it called me to say, we need to witness more individually as Christian people, as God's people. Um, and to say about the, have something to say about the ideologies that are being, um, are believed really by many today in our country and are now being promoted. And I think it calls us to a witness, not just sit here, but also to be talking to that. And so, we honor our country as we go with the hymn, America the Beautiful, and then we'll do the two pledges of allegiance. Let's stand for the two verses in the pledge, if you can. Oh, beautiful for spacious skies, We join in the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And then to the cross of our Lord. I pledge allegiance to the Christian flag and to the Savior for whose kingdom it stands, one Savior, crucified, risen, and coming again with life and liberty for all who believe. Please be seated.
and rules the We make our beginning in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray together that prayer of the day as it is printed. Gracious and ever-loving God, we thank and praise you for the freedom we have in you, and also the freedom we celebrate today in our nation as your grace has been sufficient for your people throughout all time. Grant that it will be sufficient for us as well, for your power is made perfect in our weaknesses through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. Our Old Testament reading this morning comes from the book of Isaiah, chapter 61, beginning with the first verse. The Spirit of God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to grant to those who mourn in Zion, to give them a beautiful headdress instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the garment of praise instead of a faint spirit, that they may be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord that he may be glorified. They shall build up the ancient ruins, they shall raise up the former devastations. They shall repair the ruined cities, the devastations of many generations. Strangers shall stand and tend your flocks. Foreigners shall be your plowmen and vine dressers. But you shall be called the priests of the Lord. They shall speak of you as the ministers of our God. You shall eat the wealth of the nations and 
their glory you shall boast. Instead of your shame, there shall be a double portion. Instead of dishonor, they shall rejoice in their lot. Therefore, in their land, they shall possess a double portion. They shall have everlasting joy. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our epistle lesson this morning comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 12, beginning with the first verse. I must go on boasting, though there is nothing to be gained by it. I will go on to visions and revelations of the Lord. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know, God knows. And I know that this man was caught up into paradise. Whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know, God knows. And he heard things that cannot be told, which man may not utter. On behalf of this man I will boast, but on my behalf I will not boast, except of my weaknesses. Though if I should wish to boast, I would not be a fool, for I would be speaking the truth. But I refrain from it, so that no one may think more of me than he sees in me or hears from me. So to keep me from being too elated by the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given to me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from being too elated. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Alleluia, let the greatest among you become as the youngest and the leader as one who serves. But I am among you as one who serves. Alleluia. Please stand for the reading of our gospel if you are able. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the 22nd chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. A dispute arose among them, the disciples, as to which of them was to be regarded as the greatest. And he said to them, the kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and those in authority over them are called benefactors. But not so with you. Rather, let the greatest among you become as the youngest, and the leader is one who serves. For who is greater, one who reclines at table, or one who serves? Is it not the one who reclines at table? But I am among you as one who serves. You are those who have stayed with me in my trials, and I assign to you as my Father assigned to me a kingdom, that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom, and sit on thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Hymn 821.
The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. As I mentioned at the beginning, I was disheartened and I probably thought to myself, maybe I shouldn't have said that. But often in our world today, and I think it's appropriate on July 4th, that maybe we think about more seriously our witness as Christians in our world. Um, our witness of anyone for anyone in terms of belief in a mighty God and creator whom we call Father, who sent his son to us. But what a text we have. Our second lesson for today. Our second lesson for today gives us really a formula for our lives of faith and prayer. No matter where we might stand on a political spectrum, it does tell us what our job is. As I read the three different opinions in our paper today, I thought none of them really recognized, it seemed to me anyway, the presence of God in life. And so it had to be a paid advertisement by Hobby Lobby. And I'm not advertising for them, but they paid for it. With the headline, Blessed is the Nation Whose God is the Lord. And I thought to myself, hooray, somebody said it. Somebody has to say it. You and I are called to say it. And not to say it in a boastful or arrogant way. That's one of my sins sometimes I think is I've heard it all before. And you ought to listen to what I say. Doesn't get me very far. <laughs> Even in family, especially in family. <laughs> they know me too well. But here it is, where the Apostle Paul talks about his weaknesses, his vulnerability, and said, you know, three times I talked to God and asked him to take it away. It didn't happen. So what good was prayer? What was good was my faith in him. But God gave him an answer. My power is made perfect in your weakness. God's power was made perfect in the death of our Lord on the cross. God's power is made perfect in us through his spirit as we talk about our weaknesses, as we with vulnerability may present ourselves before others in talking about a gracious God. And that helps. You know, we're, there's speculation about what that weakness of Paul was. Uh, later, it's surmised because in his letter to the Galatians, he says, see with what large hand I write. That it may have been something with his eyes he couldn't see very well, or may have been some kind of tremors, who knows. But it's his weakness. You see, God's plan for our lives sometimes isn't readily apparent. Think about it. Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, no one prayed more earnestly. And his prayer was answered in a different way. Because he said, not my will, but yours be done. If there's a different way to the cross, he wanted it, but there wasn't. We pray... Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In my life, we hear the Apostle John write, if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. James writes, the prayer of the righteous man has a great power in its effects. He isn't saying God rewards good people and punishes people who aren't so good. 
by tenny, turning a deaf ear to anyone. God didn't take Paul's thorn away after the prayers. It's certain that you and I can only guess about our prayers and God's plans for us because we have the why questions. It starts when we're about two years old, I think, or is it three? Child psychologists can tell me that when our children start saying, why? We don't stop, do we? Why did my loved one die when I prayed so hard? Why did death come so early? Why do I feel so lo lonely at times? Why can't I find a job that gives me satisfaction and helps me support my family? Why didn't I get the grade I desired when I studied so hard? Why do my relationships at times fail? Why can't I find some peace in my life and in our world? In answer to all of the whys, there is a constant affirmation of Scripture that God does care. In our baptisms, that promise is given. I will never leave you nor forsake you. And that the hairs of your head, or lack of them, are all numbered. God gave his life in Jesus on the cross for each of us, and God does have a plan and does care. The answers may be different from what we want. They may be yes, there may be no, there may be something else, there may be weight. Paul thought through personal strength, intellect, and power, and he had plenty of intellect. He was as great a scholar as anyone. He thought those were the way to make an impression on the Corinthians with the gospel message of Jesus died and risen again. And it was a little while later that he came to another group, the Ephesians, and said, it didn't work. I came to you in weakness and vulnerability, and I found out that the answer is centered in the cross of Christ. In Jesus died and risen again. God said to Paul, my power is made perfect in your weakness. How does that happen in your life and mine? There's a story of little Anne who was blinded by an accident and the details are enough to make one cry and question God's care. But in the course of time, she was able to say, because I am blind, God is going to help me see things that are really important. See things that are really important. There are stories of those in military, wounded in service to our country, who've gone on to service and protective lives in spite of their limits and their wounds. All things work together for good to those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. You see, most of the accomplishments in our lives have been done when we refuse to settle for limitations or are able to work within them. I will all the more boast of my weaknesses, writes Paul, because there is where God's power and strength comes. Paul also found out that God's schedule was not the same as his. And it's different from ours, isn't it, at times? It's God's way of teaching us to listen and to learn. They're not dependent on our emotions. Faith isn't the key to answered prayer, but a delayed answer is often the key to faith. You know that as a congregation as you go through a call process. The answers were no twice for a full-time pastor. But you keep working at it. 
You keep working and say God's time and his schedule will come to pass. Someone said, God gives four openings with which to take in information. Two eyes, two ears. But he gives us only one opening to give out information, our mouth. And so we need to listen and to look four times as much as we talk. Be still and know that I am God. And so God may delay so that we learn to use what we have before we ask for more. Paul learned to work with calamities, insults, hardships, persecutions, weaknesses. Because that's what he had to work with. And he used them to be that powerful witness to a gracious God. There was a little town in the French Pyrenees where there was a shrine famous for its miracles of healing. And one day shortly after World War II, an amputee veteran appeared at the shrine. And as he hobbled painfully along the way, someone remarked, that silly man, does he think God will give him back his leg? Overhearing the remark, the young veteran turned and replied quietly, of course I do not expect it. I'm going to pray to God to help me live without it. His weakness became a source for God's strength. In our baptisms, he makes us that promise that we are his. And then he calls us to go out and to say, isn't this God's way? To approach somebody and say, maybe there's a different way. Maybe God gives us something else. And he brings us to his table and offers us his very body and blood and tells us to go in peace and serve him. Because here we receive his forgiveness, his strength, and that healing and that strengthening in weakness that we so desperately need. And so when in doubt or weakness about his care, look to the cross and remember Paul, remember the resurrection. Because there you become strong. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And now may the peace of God which truly passes all understanding. Keep our hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. I invite you to stand as we profess our Christian faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father and he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen.
Included in our prayers this morning will again be a prayer for Doug Otto uh, as he recovers from those blood clots. Let us pray for the whole people of God and all people according to their needs. Almighty and most holy God, we thank and praise you for all you provide us freely by your grace. We are especially thankful for the freedoms we enjoy and celebrate today as we gather to worship you. Lord, in your mercy, we pray for the leaders of our nation, state, and community. We acknowledge that you have placed them in these positions to govern us and all people of this land. Grant them wisdom. Lead them to make decisions that are in line with your will for all people. Lord, in your mercy. Amid the thorns of this life, we lean on your grace, knowing that is sufficient for us, and in our weakness, your strength shines through. We ask for your grace and healing for those who grieve as we name them silently in our hearts. We ask for your grace and healing for those struggling in body, mind, and spirit, especially Doug, and those whom we name in our hearts. Lord, in your mercy. In the nation and in communities where we are thankful to have brothers and sisters in Christ, yet there are also many who have either disconnected from you and your church or who have never known you. Lead us to share your grace with others. Guide our conversations and grow our relationships with those who do not share the hopes we have. Lord, in your mercy. No matter where life takes us, we know we, you, we are in your hands. So we confidently come before you as your children and place these prayers and all our concerns into your gracious hands. In Jesus' name, amen. our native land for me she Uh, announce, announcements, I guess, are that there is coffee, I believe, in uh, Parish Hall, and then uh, there's Bible class. Our Bible class continues today on First Peter. Any other announcements? Oh, Mike Box is in the... Uh, can't miss them. Uh, <laughs> the LWML Mike Boxes are you're on the side uh, for all of their problems. Lord be with you as you continue to celebrate our nation today. 